Please take your Bible tonight, if you would, please, to Matt. Unless he doesn't want me to read it. Matthew 23. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 37 through 39. Let's read 37 together, and I'll read 38. Then let's end together by reading verse 39. Matthew 23, verse 37. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And let's begin together in verse 37 of Matthew 23. Ready? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful singing tonight from the congregation and the choir special. And uh, Lord, the good uh, spirit here in the service. And thank you for those who graduated from the Grove City School of the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for people who are eager to learn your word and to obey your word. Thank you for the faithfulness of people to be in church on Sunday evening. Lord, I'm praying your blessing now on the special as it's given. I pray, Lord, it'll tune our hearts with yours and you'll put us in, uh, our hearts will be in right soil that the word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. So bless the special to that end, please. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I'm nothing on my own. I make mistakes, I often slip. <clears throat> Just common flesh and bone. But I'll prove someday just why I say I'm of a special kind. For when he was on the cross, mind for he knew me yet he loved me he whose glory makes the heaven shine so unworthy mercy and yet when he was on the cross I was on his mind a look of love was on his face and thorns were on his head blood was on his scarlet robe Stained in crimson red, though his eyes were on the crowd that day, he looked ahead in time, for when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. For he
Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now and we ask for your blessing as we open up your word tonight. We pray that you will minister to our hearts this evening as only you can. Give me clarity of mind and thought as I bring the message this evening and please help the individuals as they listen. Lord, I pray that you would have your will and way in each heart and life this evening and as we look at the compassion that the Lord Jesus has, that we would allow that compassion to flow through us in our lives as well. So speak to us this evening, help us to focus, help us to be, to, to give us your, to give you our undivided attention, so that Lord we will not miss what you want to say to us this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it, Amen. In Matthew 23, we read the last few verses But really, Matthew 23 is one of the uh, most scathing chapters of the Bible and some of the most scathing words that Jesus ever gave. And He gave those words to the Pharisees. Give me just a little bit more, Dean, if you would. He uh, gave those words to the Pharisees. Oftentimes through this passage, you'll hear the words, Woe unto you! Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees! Hypocrites! And He just lays them out. Uh, some of the most difficult and uh, uh, toughest words he had to the Pharisees. But then, where we read this evening, you see the other side of the Lord Jesus. And you see the compassion that he has. In fact, the verses we read, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. After all these rebukes to the Pharisees and these pronouncements of judgment, I would expect Jesus to say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, when you stoned the prophets or you killed the prophets and stoned them, I sent unto you, how often I would have judged you and squished you like a bug. That's what the slave ball version would have said. But that's not what he said. You see his heart of compassion that comes through in in the heart of Jesus Christ. Even though he exposes the hypocrisy and the lies of the Pharisees, we see his tender heart toward the people of Israel. You know, Matthew 9, where we read this morning, how he had compassion on the multitude. It really isn't just a cliche that people don't, really care how much you know until they know how much you care. That Before that ever became a cliche, it was biblical. Okay, uh, It's what the Bible teaches. And Jesus uh, helps us with that. George Washington Carver said, How far you go in life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. Did you catch that? Boy, that was good. That was really a powerful statement. Tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. The compassionate way Jesus dealt with the woman who they said had been taken in adultery in the very act. And the compassionate way He dealt with her to where He could say, Go and sin no more. When the rich young ruler came to Him, asking Him about eternal life, and the Bible says Jesus, beholding Him, loved Him. Loved Him. Compassion that Jesus had. Compassionate feelings, compassionate words marked the life of the Lord Jesus. In 1858, revivalist Jeremiah Menili brought his preaching to Belfast, Ireland. As he preached repentance and salvation and restitution and committing yourself to the Lord, the men who worked in the shipyard there were, became convicted of their sin. They repented and they trusted Christ as their Savior. But they didn't stop there they begin to return the tools that they pilfered through the years. That's, that's what I used to preach restitution for. Are you ready for this? 
The response was so great, the shipyard had to build extra sheds to take in all the return tools. In fact, the company finally had to ask that there be no further returns of stolen property. They didn't have room to receive it. You know the Holy Spirit's working in a community when people start living like real Christians and, and making tangible changes in their life. That's when revival comes. And that's the fruit of the Gospel. You know, I think the word that summarizes the Lord Jesus would be the word compassion. Compassion. What is compassion? Well, compassion is suffering with another. It's, it's painful sympathy. It's, a, it's a, 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 a sensation of sorrow excited by the distress or misfortunes of another. It's a, it's a mixed passion. It's a combination of love and sorrow. Jesus has both when it comes to us. Compassion. When Jesus saw the multitudes, you read it over and over again, He was moved with compassion. I want to give you several thoughts this evening. And number one is this, compassion takes responsibility for the need. You know, compassion always means I'm willing to get involved. Jesus, when He had compassion, meant that He'll get involved. When, in fact, look at, look at uh, Mark chapter 8, would you please? Turn to, with me to Mark chapter 8. Here's another time when Jesus fed a multitude. We talked about the feeding of the 5,000 this morning. The Bible says here in Mark 8 and verse 1, In those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called His disciples unto Him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with Me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for diverse of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked him, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples and set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they, had, they that had eaten were about 4,000, and He sent them away. Now we have the feeding of the 4,000. And again, they were fed because Jesus had compassion on them. He didn't want to send them away hungry. He, he gives to the disciples, and they gave to the people, and they fed the folks to the full. And, and the reason that happened is they gave Jesus everything they had. When you give Jesus everything you have, He can bless a multitude of people with it. More than what you could ever do on your own. And of course, they had uh, seven basketfuls left over. And you say, well, we don't see God do that today. Well, how many people give God everything they have? You know, you don't always see. It. We think it all ought to be on God's side. God's side of things. Well, God says He responds to what we do. Uh, if we give Him all, and listen, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. But it all starts with that first word, give. You see, we initiate that on our side of things. And then God responds to what we do. Compassion involves willingness and taking responsibility for the need. He, he had compassion on them, but He took responsibility to do something about it. And He feeds them. And He gives them something to eat. But secondly, I want you to notice compassion involves willingness. Willingness. And willingness means that you'll meet the deepest need, not just the surface need. It's easy to just treat the surface problem and not get down to the real need. It's when Jesus sees a leper and He goes and touches him. A leper were the outcasts of society. 
In fact, whenever anybody got close to them, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so no one would get close to them. Jesus ignored that and risked the scorn of society because He's willing. Wilt thou be made whole or can you make me clean? And Jesus said, I will. And immediately His leprosy was cleansed. Listen, compassion always involves you willing to help somebody and help with their deepest need, not just a surface need. Don't, don't have shallow caring like so many do. Like the fellow who said, uh, uh, he wrote a letter to his girlfriend just trying to tell her how much she meant to him. And he wrote this. He said, for you, I would cross the hottest and driest desert. For you, I would swim the deepest ocean. For you, I would brave the wildest storm. For you, I would climb the heights of Everest. Such is the depth of my love for you. And then he put P.S. I won't be over Saturday. The forecast calls for snow. <laughs> That's about the extent of some people's love for the Lord. What it ought to be is this. And Dr. Paul Brand wrote in a book called In His Image. He wrote about his mother who at 75 years old was still walking miles every day visiting the villages in the southern part of India teaching people about Jesus. One day at 75 years of age she was traveling alone and fell and broke her hip. She laid there for two days in pain. When workers finally found her and put her on a makeshift cot loaded her into, her, into a jeep and drove 150 miles over the deep rutted roads, and Brother Yoder's probably been on some of those roads, to a doctor who could set the broken bones. But the bumpy ride damaged her hips so badly that they never could completely, it never did completely heal. Dr. Brand said, I visited my mother in her mud-covered hut several weeks after all this happened. I watched as she took two bamboo crutches that she made herself, moved from one place to another with her feet just dragging behind because she's lost all feeling in them. At age 75, with a broken hip, unable to stand on her own two legs, I thought I made a pretty intelligent suggestion when I suggested that she retire. And she turned around and looked at me and said, what value is that? If we try to preserve this body just a few more years and it's not being used of God, what value is that? She kept on working. She kept on riding her donkey to villages until she was 93 years of age. At age 93, she couldn't stay on the donkey anymore. She kept falling off. But she didn't stop serving God. She had Indian men carry her in hammocks from one village to another, and then she continued to tell people about Jesus Christ until she died at 95 years of age. That's compassion. That's a willingness to meet people with their deepest need. Suffering with another. Compassion is a mixed passion. Love and sorrow together. Jesus had compassion for people. He had concern for those who are suffering. And He still does. Don't, don't take that in the past tense. That He did and He does it now. He does now. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cares about you and me. And He had mercy and He has forgiveness for people just like us. I read the story about a bitter cold evening in northern Virginia. An old man sat by a river waiting for a ride across. His beard was glazed by winter's frost and the wait seemed endless. His body became numb and stiff from the frigid north wind. He heard the faint steady rhythm of approaching hooves and galloping along the frozen path. Anxiously he watched as several horsemen rounded the bend he let the first one pass without an effort to get his attention. And another passed, and then another. Finally, the last rider was nearing the spot where the old man sat like a snow statue. As this man passed, the 
the old man caught the writer's eye and said, Sir, would you mind giving an old man a ride to the other side? There doesn't appear to be any passage by foot. Reining in his horse, the rider replied, Sure thing, hop aboard. Then seeing the old man was half frozen and unable to lift his body from the ground, the horseman dismounted and helped the old man up onto the horse. The horseman then took the old man not just across the river, but to his destination, which was just a few miles further. As they neared the tiny but cozy cottage, the horseman's curiosity caused him to inquire, Sir, I noticed you left several other riders pass without making any effort to secure a ride. But when I rode up, you immediately asked me for a ride. I'm curious why on such a bitter, cold winter night you would wait and ask for the last rider. What if I'd refused and left you there? The old man lowered himself down from the horse, looked the rider straight in the eyes, and he told him this, I've been around these here parts for some time, and I reckon I know people pretty good. And the old timer continued, I looked in the eyes of the other riders, and I immediately saw there was no concern for my situation. It would have been useless even to ask them for a ride. But when I looked into your eyes, compassion and kindness were evident. I knew then that your gentle spirit would welcome the opportunity to give me assistance in my time of need. Those heartwarming comments touched the horseman very deeply. And he said, well, I'm most grateful for what you have said. May I never get too busy with my own affairs that I fail to respond to the needs of others with kindness and compassion. And with that, Thomas Jefferson turned his horse around and made his way back to the White House. True story. Now I want you to look at Luke chapter 10 with me, will you please, to a familiar portion of Scripture with us that Jesus teaches about, I think, compassion for others. Luke 10. It's, it's a story He gives in response to a lawyer that comes to tempt Him. And the lawyer wants to justify himself. That he's okay. That he's righteous enough and really doesn't need to do anything else. Because Jesus said you have to love your neighbor as yourself. And so He says, well, who is my neighbor? And notice Luke 10 and beginning in verse number 30. Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jericho to Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came, looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had... What church? What did he have, church? Compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go thou, or go, and do thou likewise. You know, that journey from Jerusalem to Jericho is about 18 miles. It's nothing for us with uh, our vehicles, but it was something in that day, especially if you did it by foot. It was called the Bloody Way because of the dangers that were there. There were several uh, cliffs and mountains and different places where it was easy for robbers to hide and come out and rob somebody along the way. It would, it would be similar if you walk through uh, one of the, one of the more, more difficult places of Columbus with $100 bills hanging out of your pockets. Okay, uh, You're for sure to have somebody want to help themselves to what you have. And so he fell in the hands of robbers and they robbed him, 
stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, a priest came by, and, and he saw the man, the Bible says, and he passed by on the other side. In other words, he, he saw him, and he went out of his way to go to the other side of the road and get by. Not to get too close to someone who looked the way he did. Next fellow comes along, and he's a Levite. And, and the Levite does the same thing. He's at the place he looked on him and passed by on the other side. But then, there's a Samaritan. And, and this Samaritan doesn't say here in the Scripture, uh, but his name was Goando. I found that out by research. Goando. And, and he traveled and he came to where the man was. When he saw him, notice what it says, he journeyed. When he came, when he saw him, he didn't go to the other side, did he? He had compassion on him. And because he had compassion, what's the next verse say? He went to him. You have to be willing to be involved. And he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So, Gondo put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn to take care of him and said, look after him and anything you spend more, I'll pay you that when I come back. Innkeeper knew Guando to be a man of integrity, so he agreed to his request. And then he asked this lawyer, which one of these three people, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, which one do you think was neighbor to this fellow? Did you notice what the lawyer answered? He said, I think it's the one who showed mercy on him. He couldn't bring himself to say the word Samaritan. That's how much the Jews hated the Samaritans. They... They, they had a, um, they believed really the, the, that they were people that weren't any good at all. They, they hated Gentiles. In fact, they called Gentiles dogs. But they hated Samaritans worse than Gentiles. Okay? And uh, they didn't want anything uh, to, to happen to, to, good to happen to a Samaritan. They were uh, good for nothing people. And, the Levite and the priest, they don't want to get dirty. They don't want to get involved. They were, they were passive. Let me ask you a question. They didn't do anything wrong. They just didn't do anything right. Do you understand? You say, wait a minute. Uh, that Levite or that priest would say, I, I was dressed right when I was on the road. That Levite or that priest would say, well, I didn't smoke any cigarettes while I was on the road. The priest of Levi would say, well, I didn't listen to any bad music while I was on the road. They said, well, I didn't do any of those bad things. I didn't want to do anything wrong. No, no, no. Uh, you didn't do anything right. See, you didn't do the right thing. You ignored the problem. You didn't have compassion upon Him. They, they remained aloof. They didn't want to be involved. They chose not to do anything. It's not what they did what they didn't do the opposite of compassion isn't hatred it's indifference apathy someone has said the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who during a time of moral crisis do nothing they pass by on the other side they did nothing oh you say they were good yeah they were good for nothing Compassion compelled the Samaritan into action on behalf of the wounded. The innkeeper, you say, well, the innkeeper helped them. Yeah, but the innkeeper was being paid to help. There's a difference. It's not the innkeeper who's the hero of the story. It's the Samaritan. The trouble is, in our world, people are beaten and bleeding, and we lack compassion. Oh, we're not doing anything wrong. We're saying, I'm, I'm doing this and uh, I, I'm not doing this. But you know what? We're not helping them. We just pass by on the other side. We'd rather not get involved. We lack compassion. We lack concern. See, that person on the, man to, on the road to Jericho is you and me. The robber who beats him up and leaves him half dead, that's Satan. He beats people up and he comes only to, to, to steal and to kill and to destroy. Half dead means he's alive uh, physically, but he's dead spiritually. That's where men are today. Half dead. 
They need to be brought alive by faith in Jesus Christ. Satan will beat people up, and that's what he does. He beats them up and, and strips them everything they have, and then he leaves them lay to die. Who will care? Religion isn't going to help them. The Levite didn't help them. The priest didn't help them. They've been used and abused, and the great need for today is for us to realize huh, somebody needs help. Somebody's hurting. Somebody's been wounded. Somebody's been beaten up. People walk through the doors of, that, of our church every week, and you know what? They're hurting. They've been beat up. They don't need to be re beat up when they come into our doors. They need to be re injured when they come into the church. This is where they need to find help. We don't want to shoot the wounded. We don't want to misjudge them or be quick to judgment and think that, well, they're just rebellious or they're just uh, anti God or they're just. No, we may not know that. We, 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 we may can be terribly wrong in our judgment. Somebody said, well, they're not very friendly. Well, you don't know what they're carrying. You don't know what burden they have. See? You, you have to think about what they're, what they're dealing with. Some are dealing with physical abuse. Some are dealing with the pain of death or desertion. Some have infl self-inflicted wounds from just sin and a lifestyle of sin or drug or alcohol abuse. Maybe sexual immorality. Some are wounded with guilt and shame. Sometimes they come in and they're just angry or they're depressed. And that means they're not very friendly. And we can misread that. And sometimes we say, well, I'm busy. I don't have time. But you understand, when you have compassion, you get involved. When you have compassion, it's risky. It's risky. It means you don't ask, should I get involved? Or is it dangerous? Or what will this cost? Well, that's what the priest and the Levite said. But the Samaritan did. He knew it would cost something. The question is this, is this something Jesus would have me to do? Is this something Jesus would have me to do? Is this something God would want done? Our prayer should be this, let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. You ever prayed that prayer? That's, a, that's, a, that's the first step of getting compassion. Compassion takes responsibility for the need. Compassion involves willingness. Compassion compels us to act. The Samaritan's the hero because he did something. He did something. When... I said before how the lawyer tried to avoid using the word Samaritan. In fact, remember when they accused Jesus and they wanted to say something bad about Him, they said He's a Samaritan. John eight forty eight. That's the biggest insult they could come up with. I mean, they were... I was reading that a, um, the, the Samaritans were, according to the Jews, were people who worshipped on the wrong mountain. If they ate any food of a Samaritan, it would be akin to eating fried pork chops in the temple. <laughs> they knew that uh, the rabbis, some rabbis prohibited anyone from helping a Gentile woman giving birth because that would be helping one more Gentile into the world. Well, the Samaritans, they hated worse than Gentiles. So they despised the Samaritans. And so that's why this lawyer had to say, well, the one who had mercy on him or the one who had compassion on him. And that word compassion there has to do with your, your gut feeling. You feel it in your, as the Bible calls it, your bowels. Bowels of mercy. That's compassion. You feel it inside that the Lord gives you. And he took care, this Samaritan takes care of the stranger's injuries. He binds up the wounds. He gives them the oil and the wine. He puts them on his own beast. He takes them to the inn. He pays for it. See, compassion compelled Goando to do this. He never feels like he's done enough. He takes him to a safe place. He takes him to the inn. I believe the inn here is the local church. If that picture of that injured man is you and me, and, and he pours in the oil and the wine, and, he, and that's a picture of the Lord Jesus healing our wounds. 
and he, he, he heals our wounds of sin that He's given to us. And then the place that we recover and the place that we grow and the thing, place that we get better is the local church. And that's where we're taken care of. And that's, where the, that's the way the church ought to be. The church is a hospital. The church is a place where folks who are sick and wounded and hurt, they come to get well. Don't, they don't come to get beat up and come to get hurt. They enter in and they find acceptance and safety. It's interesting. Gowando didn't walk right up and miraculously heal the wounded man. Compassion costs something. It costs him time to take him on his beast and take him to an end. Money, energy. When God had compassion on you and me, it cost Him something too. His only begotten Son. He gave Him so that we could be cured from our sin. I just want to give you three thoughts and I'll be done. Number one, open your heart. Open your heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11. Let me read that verse to you. You can turn there if you'd like. If not, just listen and I'll read it to you. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11 says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Now most of us don't have a problem with that part of the verse. Okay? Our mouth is open to you, but listen to the second part. Our heart is enlarged. He said, my heart's open to you. That's what Paul was saying. Ask God to allow you to see along the highway of life what He wants you to see. Let my heart be broken, God, with the things that break your heart. Don't pray that unless you mean it. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. It may take you places you never thought you'd go. It may have you doing some things you never thought you'd do. Lord, break my heart for the things that break your heart. Number two, Stop yourself from giving pat answers to people. James 1 and verse 19, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Listen, listen, listen. Very few people listen. Most of the time when someone else is talking, we're thinking about what we are going to say. And we're not listening to what they're saying. Christians are real good at cliches and just saying things and not really listening to what someone's saying to them. So you have to listen. When you have compassion, you listen to what people are saying. Open your heart. Stop yourself from giving pat answers. And number three, weep with those that weep. Romans 12 Verse 15. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those that rejoice. But do we weep with those that weep? It didn't say preach to those that weep. It didn't say judge those that weep. It didn't say fix those that weep. And it doesn't even say stop those from weeping. How many times you face somebody who's broken hearted and they're crying and the first words we say are, don't cry. Oh, don't cry. Oh, don't, don't stop crying. When the Bible says we're supposed to weep with those that weep. You know what that is? Compassion. Compassion. When Jesus came to the grave of Lazarus and they were all weeping, the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, what is it? Jesus wept. And when you read verse 36, you know what it says? The people there, they said, behold how He loved Him. Jesus didn't go there saying, oh man, I know you're upset, but I, I loved Him too. He didn't say anything. What did He do? He wept. And that said more than His words could ever say. He wept with those that were weeping and they knew He loved them.
You want to let someone know you love them? Weep. Weep with them. Weep with them. Compassion makes the difference. I think I've told you this before. Years ago, we had, uh, I've, I've mentioned the Longo family, Bill Longo and then his wife, Jerry Longo. And Jerry Longo one day had a lady she brought forward in church to make her profession of faith in Christ. And I just thought this, Brother Jarvis, this lady was Jehovah's Witness. And uh, she got saved. And um, but she had had, you know, we were in an area at that time uh, in Arizona where a lot of Mormons and folks did a lot of uh, visiting and such and different people come by your home and you know, this lady made the, made the remark that Jehovah's Witness had been to her house, the Mormons had been to her house, and she wouldn't listen to any of them. And I asked her that morning, I said, why did you listen to Mrs. Longo? Why, when she knocked on your door, did you decide you'd listen to what she'd have to say? She said, I listened to her because of her tears. As she talked to her, Jerry began to weep. You know what she did? She listened to what she was saying. And God broke her heart. He said, I listened to Mrs. Longo because of her tears. I wonder if there's people who we witness to or loved ones or friends who were concerned about them. We've never been able to get through to them. I wonder if they'd listen if when we talked to them it was accompanied by tears. Because God had squeezed our heart. When God squeezes your heart, liquid comes out your eyes. Did you know that? Let God squeeze your heart for people. Compassion. What the priest and the Levite didn't have is compassion on those who'd been stripped naked and beaten by Satan. Lack of compassion, you know what it does? Make you go by on the other side of the street. Make you go by the other side. Make you look the other way and not even look at the situation where you could help. Now, some of you might be puzzled, and I'll, I'll clear this up for you, then I'll pray. Because I mentioned that Samaritan's name is Gwando. It's G-O-A-N-D-O. -O. You, you could say it, go and do. Because I know his last name. It's likewise. <laughs> go and do. Likewise. So don't come to me and say, how do you know his name? That's what that was. <laughs> Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Make us people of compassion. Oh, compassion makes a difference. I see it so often in Jesus' ministry. Whether it's the leper, whether it's the blind man, whether it's the woman taken in adultery, whether it's the rich young ruler, whether it's the woman at the well, compassion. And Lord, I pray that there would be numbers of people in this room tonight, Bible Baptist Church, we would pray and ask You that You might break our heart over the things that break Your heart. That we would keep ourselves from giving pat answers. We would learn to listen and hear the cries of people for help. And Lord, we would weep with them that weep. I pray that you would give us compassionate hearts. And Lord, while people may, may hear about Bible Baptist Church, I pray that they would be able to say they they love people over there. They had compassion on me when I went through a difficult time. I don't want to be the priest. I don't want to be the Levite. We just like to be like that Samaritan. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for having compassion on us. I pray that we'll allow that compassion to flow through us to others. And having compassion, it will make a difference. 